we're back with Bill Nagara again. Uh, we're going to look at the case of Julie Ferguson today. If you guys remember, I did a video on Julie, a deep dive into uh, her disappearance, I guess. It was for a day before her body was found, I believe. But I was contacted by a Julie's friend, whose also name is Julie. And that is how I got that case and looked into it. Sent a bunch of cases over to Bill to pick through, and this is one that he had come up with that he thought maybe uh, was of interest, and he had some knowledge that he could share with me as well as you to um, maybe get some resolution to this case. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bill. Bill, you uh, ready to go here? Yeah, as ready as I can be. We talked about right prior to us going on. Um, I'm doing this particular interview, if you want to call them that, from a concrete small yard. It looks like it's a pizza uh, slice shape. And this is a famous yard because this is where at Corcoran Prison, a lot of the, the gladiators pit uh, occurred, which was that they would release gang members from different fractions or factions to actually combat each other and then they were subsequently shot when the when it was finished and uh, it was shot and then of course these yards are very famous here because of this uh, this particular yard is 4b1l2 and this yard um, is famous because of those reasons guys died out here in these fights that were basically orchestrated by the staff that was subsequently arrested and put in prison for that. When was that, just by curiosity? What year? Oh, this happened in the uh, early 1990s and through the 1990s, in about 10 years. If people look it up, they'll find that Corcoran Prison was famous for these particular gladiator fights that were... Um, basically orchestrated by a particular group of staff members that are no longer here. This prison now has changed. It is more a prison for men who are trying to do better with their lives, to try and rehabilitate, so it's a PF2, which, is, which translates to a program facility two. Prior to this, it was a level four 180, which is basically the whole from some of the worst gang members and mafia members that there are in the system. Wow. Well, okay, we will go from, uh, that's a segue, from fighting in prison to fighting on the street is what Julie Ferguson ended up doing uh, based on her defensive wounds. She really fought for her life. So let's jump into Julie Ferguson, age 17, on March 20th, 1995, when uh, she is last seen alive. Yeah, exactly right. We have uh, Julie Ferguson. She's 17 years old. She's a beautiful young woman, young lady. Uh, she's a junior at Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Greenbelt, Maryland. And she had aspirations to be a journalist. The, the timeline here is that March 20th, 1995, she gets off of work where she worked at a shopping mall or shopping center. Um, I don't know how many of the audience remember shopping malls, but um, these are popular. They have, it's a place with a lot of different stores, so a lot of different people were there. We're talking about thousands of people per day walk in and out of these malls and these places. And she worked as a shopping clerk, which she had a lot of exposure to different type of people. And she was supposed to get picked up after work, approximately 9.30, by her friends, and they had this mother's a friend's mother's funeral was the following day I, I don't know if she was actually going to spend a night with her friends but I, I think in that in this situation that's kind of irrelevant uh the friends arrived just before 10 o'clock and they were a bit late and julie was supposed to be outside of the liquor store you know, really close to the mall in the mall parking lot waiting for her friends when they arrived she was nowhere to be found. They found actually her work clothes on the floor next to a soda bottle. And their friends becoming uh, alarmed that she wasn't there, they called her mother and subsequently she was reported missing. About seven and a half hours later, on March 21st at 5.30 a.m. or approximately that time, the two men on the way to work found 
her body. She was on the side of a road, four or five miles from the mall, and we later find out that she was strangled and then her throat was slit. She had defensive wounds on her hands. Uh, there was no sexual assault that we know of, uh, and her hands were tied behind her back. At least this is what I'm getting from uh, the reports I got. Am I correct so far, Matt? I mean, I'm sorry, Ken. I'm going to let that Matt slip go. That was two weeks in a row, but we'll work on that for later. <laughs> like, no, no, you're, you're right. You're right. That's so far so good. Okay, so, you know, um, to jump a little bit ahead, so far what we have is, from what I understand, the investigate yielded that, that Julie was seen leaning into a red or burgundy Volkswagen Jetta. And some of the witnesses say that there were three people in the car, two um, men of African descent, descent and one woman of African descent. Another witness then said that a car similar to that was found was seen near the road around midnight where she was found dead with the lights on. There were a couple of investigations done on this car. It yielded no results. Um, there was a person of interest by the name of Doug De Silva who was in jail prior to their prison for a rape of a woman very close to where Julie was found and he has suddenly disappeared. However, the DNA has cleared him. And I'm, I'm kind of going through this this way to clear the people that we know should be cleared so we don't get caught and stuck in that particular, you know, uh, I guess, box. Because I believe that this had, truly, I, I, it's possible that this car, where she was leaning into, um, had something to do with it. However, I don't believe so. And if I'm mistaken in anything I've said so far, uh, Ken, please let me know because then I'll go into what I believe happened that night to Julie Ferguson. Let's talk about why. Let's talk about the DNA clearing a individual. Refresh my mind, maybe, and if you know, and if you don't, then we can make assumptions. Uh, what kind of DNA do the police have if she was not sexually assaulted? You're very correct in that. And I, my eyebrow rose immediately when I saw that because they said there was no sexual contact. But you and I both know, and the audience does too, that you know, some of these killers, serial killers or even just sexual predators, don't need to have sexual intercourse with the person or the body. They simply... Uh, they, they masturbate, and that is a possibility. So we don't, I, I actually don't know whether the DNA was trace DNA, maybe because she fought back so fiercely, there was DNA under the fingernails, or that there was just DNA on the body that was traced back to someone that was a hair, a fiber, etc. Yeah, so, uh, so the second part of that is then we can assume that police do have DNA and we can assume that it must be of relevance meaning it's not just touch DNA that from a shirt that has multiple people that have touched it because if they are eliminating suspects based off of that DNA that DNA must be something uh, so maybe they're holding back a vital clue that maybe she was sexually assaulted and they don't want that out there. That's a possibility. It is a possibility and I thought about that but I figured that they would put that if she were uh, assaulted that that would be put out there because there's really no reason to hide that. There's nothing there. Obviously it's known that she had that they have DNA but I believe what happened was, and this leads to kind of the path where I'm at regarding what happened, is that the DNA found was from maybe on the body because the body was clothed, if I were, am I correct? And she still was uh, uh, restrained, her hands were restrained behind her back. So I believe that the, the perpetrator actually uh, masturbated after she was dead. And I believe, and again, this will go to my theory of what happened that night. 
Okay. Yeah, and and you're right. It seemed to me that if she is still clothed, she's bound at least behind her back with her hands. Uh, she had one shoe, I think, that was missing, or it was it was off of her foot, but it was close to her body, I believe, something to that extent. Um, so, yeah, sexual assault, eh, maybe, um, but they certainly are not releasing that if it was. And like you said, if, they, if she was, then they probably have no reason to hold that back. So go ahead with uh, what you think is going on here. obvious that stands out to me immediately is first and foremost that Julie Ferguson is a fighter. This young woman, young lady was in a fight for her life and the person who uh, took her uh, it realized that, that she was a fighter, that she was not a pushover she wasn't just going to curl up this young woman fought so what I believe happened is and this is why I don't believe that the Jetta is involved. The people who saw her leaning into the car didn't report anything that she was in an argument, that she didn't know the people. It seemed that she knew the people, maybe from high school, maybe from around town. Uh, and she was leaning, and there was no threatening uh, you know, confrontation. If the person saw her leaning in the car... You have 60 seconds remaining. Actually, let me call back, and I'll continue with uh, my theory. Okay. I'll be back. So that's why I believe that this Jetta is not really relevant. It might be, but I don't think it is. The person would have reported, look, she was fighting to stay in the car. And, and we know by what is left at the crime scene, or the, the initial crime scene, because she was kidnapped for abducted, that that didn't happen because... She, her clothes were left there, a soda was left there, she was more than likely uh, drinking out of, and prior her DNA was found on the, the, uh, the bottle because, and that's why they know it's hers. So if she would have just gotten in the car uh, of her own accord, she would have taken her clothes and her bottle with her. She did not. So. I don't believe that Jenna is involved in that in that sense. She knew the people, obviously. She was leaning into the car. There was no threatening gestures that the person reported. So I don't believe that car is there. So what happened to her must have happened between like 9.30 and 10, probably just before 10 o'clock. Her friends arrived, so 9.45-ish, 9.40. And what I believe happened is somebody pulled up to probably ask for directions or say, hey, by the way, and if I were the one, and I've heard other killers talk about this, specifically serial killers talk about, and I'll give you a couple names, Rodney Alcala is one. Uh, William Bonnie would do this, as would uh, Randy Kraft, scorecard killer. They would pull up to somewhere, they would see somebody that's a potential victim that they like, they want, and they ask them something very silly with this sense would be, hi, uh, you work at this particular place. Are you open tomorrow? They may say low enough for the person to get close enough to the car, which makes me believe that there was two people involved, not just one. For one person to do this, it'd be very difficult for him to open the door, get out of the car, run after the person, grab her, pick her up. There's just too many chances of getting seen. Now, I don't know what this mall looked like at 940, but from what I understand, I used to work at a mall in the 19, early 1980s, and I know that at 930 when the mall's about to close, there's people in and out of those places. So I believe there's two perpetrators. One is submissive, the other one is the dominant. The person grabbed her from the open window of the car or open the door quickly, grabbed her and dragged her in. There was no time for the clothes. There was no time for the bottle because that's a giveaway. Had he taken the bottle and the, uh, the clothes, they wouldn't have known where she disappeared from. The question would be, maybe she got in the car, maybe she did, maybe she walked somewhere else. But we know where the abduction scene is because the bottle and the clothes are there. So therefore, she was taken from that place. Once she was taken... Somebody had to hold her down. There's no way you can hold the person while you're driving. And obviously, she fought back. We know this because of defensive wounds on the hands. So I'm thinking there's two people involved. 
Now, that's when things start getting dicey and when I start just jumping into that mode where I've talked to so many of these serial killers and killers that I'm kind of imagining what could happen. One of them held her down, one drove. There were only four or five miles from the locations where she was found. The defensive wounds suggest she fought back extremely hard. So much so, she may have broken fingernails on the person's uh, on skin. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Maybe she came under the fingernails. She was uh, at some point subdued. But I believe that once she woke up again, she began fighting back. And Ken, uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you talk to killers as I have in some circumstances, and we know that they have a particular mindset. They imagine what, how it's going to happen, that they are dominant, that they're controlling the situation, that they're going to get their jollies off because it's happening exactly how they want. And correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes when these individuals, if they're very controlling, and the dumb is the one probably in control of the situation, the other one subdued her, when she woke up and began fighting back again, when she understood what was going to happen to her, there's a very good chance that she fought back so hard that this particular guy, the dominant, just became so enraged that she basically threw off his plans, and that's where the strangulation happens. He's trying to subdue her. He's so mad, he ends up killing her. And then there's and subsequently after that, he slits the throat. That slit is just him enraged that he could not carry out the plan that he had. So in my opinion, that's what happened that night. This young lady fought so hard that she ruined their plans, and that's why she was killed. Not that she wouldn't have been killed anyways, but they wanted her alive because I believe that their intent was to rape and kill Okay, so I was just going to ask you that. You believe that the purpose of this abduction was a sexual assault and not a robbery. Absolutely. Right. Because if the robbery was in their mind, that you would have found items or taken, and from what I understand, nothing was taken from her. Well, and you have to think, also, and I think we talked about this in the Stephanie Coyle case, maybe, or there was another one where, what did she have worth taking, you know, to be a victim of a robbery, right? Right, but sometimes it's a thing of opportunity. You see a purse laying around, you just grab it, or you take it because it's a souvenir. Either way, if, if there was... If there was, the purse was taken, so you could technically say it's a robbery, but it's a secondary um, motive, and really not a motive at all. It's an opportunity thing, like she was. For example, she was sitting outside that mall waiting for her friends. No one could have known that except that immediate circle of friends. The chances the perpetrator knew that are pretty low. He probably just drove by with his accomplice, saw her. It was a... It's a, it's a situation of opportunity. Wow, look at that. Let's go after it. And I believe that's what happened. Now, these guys could be organized killers, meaning that she obviously, they may have seen her at the mall, had may already planned to do this, but this circumstance, the circumstance that happened was opportunity. They had no idea she would be there at that late, just wait, waiting around for friends to, to pick her up. Yeah, so I want to jump back to what you said about nobody witnessing her scream or getting abducted or anything like that. I always try to explain to people, you know, you get somebody close to a vehicle and it is very easy to put a gun, to put a knife to their rib, to their throat and say, you're getting in this car, you make a word, you know, I'm stabbing you, I'm shooting you. And you know most times you're not going to you're not going to do anything cuz you're scared and you go with so there might not really been a struggle per se it was just as simple as that like you said open the car door grab an arm put a knife to her get in and that's it and you drive away right no absolutely but in this case she's a young vibrant woman she's not uh she doesn't look she's like she's uh submissive she's extremely uh she's i, I would say that she's uh, outgoing 
uh, because she had a very great personality. So she's a strong young woman. Uh, that's why I believe there's two individuals. For a man, even a, a person of your size or my size, you know, fairly good shape guy, to be able to scoot across a car, open the door. When you open the door, she's going to step back. To try and grab her, put a knife her, then bring her back as a boot, that's a, that's a lot of work, especially when you have to drive. No, that's no. That's why I believe there's a secondary. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm with you on that, and I've always... I, uh, stated that as well that th it was definitely uh, more than one person but I'm just saying as a se as the secondary person it's the same thing you know if you don't want to create a scene uh, the guy's driving you're in the passenger or in the back seat you open the door and grab her put a knife to her there's not going to be much of a struggle if she's scared to uh, get you know get cut or get shot but no i'm on i'm on board with uh, more than one person and i also believe that these individuals had a knife not a gun uh by psychological standards men are more afraid of guns than women are if you point a gun at a woman she usually just takes off running if you put a knife close to her they freeze this is something I've looked at and talked to a ne number of different serial killers, and they've told me exactly that. And they didn't know about the gun. They just said that you put a knife to a woman, she immediately freezes. So I believe that's what happened. But when she realized that these guys, their intent was to assault her, then she began fighting back. Or she could have already been fighting in the car. I don't know the, the degree of defensive wounds on her hands, but I'm willing to bet that the police departments are holding back a critical uh, piece of evidence is that there are two DNAs there. Okay. That's what I believe. Um, they don't want to give that up because they want to keep that uh, in case a person does come and say, I did it, they probably want to know where you were somebody else. So I believe that's a critical piece of evidence that they're withholding, and that is that there's two distinct um, DNAs at the crime scene where she was found, and that was that these guys both masturbated after they killed her because their intent was to kill. Now, I'm also going to say that these guys do not live in the immediate vicinity, and more than likely, there are other cases, and we have different MOs because these guys realized it didn't, this didn't work for them. So they switched their MO a little bit to do it again. This, the, the killers of... Uh, Julie Ferguson has continued. If they hadn't gotten caught somewhere else, this is a case that I'm, I'm, I feel that in the future is going to be connected to another serial killer who uh, this is one of his first uh, tries, and he bungled it. He was successful in killing her, but he was unsuccessful in, in uh, reaching his goal, which was to rape, then kill. Well, I know... You know, you're saying two people, and I agree with that, but two two individuals working together as serial killers, I mean, that is pretty rare, isn't it? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Yes, in some cases, it's very rare. In other cases, it's not. So let me give you an example. I, I have met, spoken to, and actually, without his knowledge, interviewed the freeway killer, William Bonney. He was executed in 1996 by lethal injection in San Quentin State Prison. This individual, he not only raped and killed in excess of 38 young boys and young uh, teenagers, but he had three different accomplices, three different young accomplices that were about the age of the victims that were helping him. That's one case. And he talked about his crime partners being submissive to him. So he was the dominant one. Now, there's another case. I don't know. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's a Dean Carroll or Coral. He is known as the Candy Man. And he killed an excess of 30 young men between... 1970, 1973, he was known as the candy man because he owned the candy store. So, and he had three different crime partners. And you also are very aware of the toolbox killer, Lawrence Bitteker and Norris, crime partners in raping, killing young women. 
So it is rare, but it's not really that rare because it's, I, I know at least 10 different serial killers that have had crime partners. And I believe this case here is one case where we can point to two individuals working together and there's usually a dominant and one is submissive to him. Yeah, so by that token, you're really just saying that maybe the dominant one is the one who has the sexual proclivity or fantasy uh, and is a serial killer where the secondary, the submissive partner, he may not have these feelings at all and he just might be going along with the dominant male, right? Well, that's a psych. We have 60 seconds remaining. That's what psychologists want you to believe, and that's what law enforcement usually believe. But I have a different take, and I have this because I spoke to Lawrence Bittaker, the toolbox killer. I spent years, decades, talking to him about his fantasies and how he did it and what part Norris played in all this. And he had no reason to lie to me. Let me call you back. Okay. Okay, well, won't you continue with your uh, theory there, what you're going to talk about, because that's going to, it's very interesting to me, and I want to hear it, uh, what you think about the partner and the dominant submissive relationship. Okay, so when you hear the, the term dominant and submissive, TV movies, law enforcement, psychologists, they want you to believe that the person, is, the submissive person is almost in a relationship like a Stockholm relationship, Stockholm syndrome, where they are submissive to a dominant, which in some sexual circles, the guy's basically tied up and on his knees and a dominant tells him what to do and he asks him, master, what do I do? That is not what's going on here. I actually believe that those terms submissive and dominant are completely inaccurate and they really boggle and they confuse the listener, they confuse law enforcement because you get a mental picture in your mind, I'm sure, when I say dominant and submissive. So that, let's just throw that to the side. Let's get, you know, you know, Ken and Bill's version of what's going on. Because I know that you you know this because you've talked about this a number of times. It's one of the reasons I that I'm uh, that, you, that you and I see a lot of things in the same light. Because you're 20 plus years in law enforcement, and in my 40 years studying these serial killers, and we've come to the same conclusions because we have experience with these creeps. Well, so let me let me get to the point. The point is that when you say dominant submissive, you have mental picture. That's not what's going on. The more dominant of the two, meaning the, let's say he's the alpha, and he usually tells the other guy what he believes he wants. In Bitteker and Norris, they were both almost equal. Bitteker was a bit more assertive. Let's use the word assertive. It works better for me than dominant. And as him being the more assertive of the two, he would usually be the one, hey, let's get that one. But the other one was right there. He wanted it. He, he was involved in it. He was just as uh, as uh, likely to kill, to strangle, to rape than the more assertive one. So that's what you should look at this as being assertive and someone that's a little bit less assertive. That's it. In this case, like Lawrence Bittaker and Norris, it's two guys working. Look, it, these two, the, the toolbox killers, which is Norris and Bitteker, they went to trial runs, which I believe this guy didn't. They went to trial runs where they would actually get girls to get into the car with them. And they would smoke pot, they would party, they would talk, and they would just drop them off and they wouldn't touch them. They were practicing to get to the point where they knew they could execute their plan the way they wanted. One thing very unique about some of these killers is that once they have a plan, if it doesn't go the way they want it, they get very upset and then they blame the victim. So in this case, that's exactly what I believe happened here. They had a plan in their mind to abduct a young woman. They didn't know exactly what young woman. Maybe it was Julie Ferguson, but they didn't think she'd be where they found her that day. If she was just a random pick, it doesn't have to be a specific woman. It's just a woman. And they have a specific plan on how it's going to go down. If it doesn't go down that way, or, they, or they're as novice as I believe they were or are, they anticipated no fight. They didn't think about the fight. It, let, let me give you, let me stray off point for a minute here, Ken, and show you that sometimes guys in prison, criminals plan something, 
And then when it happens the way they want, they don't know what to do with us. A good example is someone that escapes. They put so much work into the escape that once they get out, they don't know what the hell to do. They haven't planned that that far ahead. With these guys, it's almost the opposite. They planned exactly they want the way they wanted it to happen. They had a pretty good location of where they wanted to go. And when they got her, they didn't expect her to be that much of a fighter. Once she did that, it threw the plan out. I would believe it would be the more assertive of the two got very upset and he ended up killing her instead of just subduing her. And then the last final thing was he got so upset that now his plan is completely ruined that he wanted to mutilate her or destroy her so he slit her throat. It was an after a moment um, reaction to her already dead. Like, you know, blaming the victim, damn it, you're dead now, you've ruined it, da 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 and boom, he cuts her throat. Okay, so this happened in 1995. I mean, these individuals are probably no longer together. You know, uh, I'm sure that that's th almost 30 years ago. Uh, they were probably, what, in their 20s, maybe 30s at that time. Uh, they're not still doing this same ruse together, you know, 30 years later, right? No, they're not. And I, and I would imagine that one of them is maybe anywhere between, you know, a few years older than the other one. One of them is younger, one of them is a little bit older. And yeah, uh, I would not doubt if they're both in prison now, they seem not to be very organized. They have a plan, so makes, that makes them organized because they had a plan. This may have been a killing of opportunity because the, the woman that they found was just a victim of opportunity. But they're... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. And how to execute it. But yeah, most of the time, the relationships like this don't last that long because they get arrested for something else. I would be, you know, I would be shocked if these guys are not in prison somewhere. And, you know, we've talked about this before, uh, Ken, that sometimes law enforcement don't have the funds to get every single case and run DNA against genetic uh, profile sites, uh, like they got the Golden State Killer, uh, D'Angelo, the number of others here, the Gilgo guy was also done very similar to that. So, you know, if, if the money's there, I think they should run DNA against genealogy sites. And that is the biggest weapon right now that law enforcement could have or private investigators could have because you don't need a court order to go on a genealogy site and kind of do this profile. You can pay a private firm to do it. So all there's needed is a bit of funding. And I would encourage uh, Mrs. Ferguson, Ms. Ferguson's family to do exactly that, run her DNA or the DNA at the crime scene compared to others, and there's probably a family tree they're going to hit on, and from there they can start working down. might take some time, but I believe that finalization in this case is warranted and needed. Absolutely. Um, one other area that you did not mention, and I'm not sure if you know about it or not, and I found out about it kind of late after I'd done my research on the case. Uh, I was going back through things, and I came across it, and I don't know if it changed things for me, but it was an interesting tidbit. And what it was is they found Julie's driver's license alongside the road, between halfway between the abduction site and the dump site, uh, like right off an intersection of a major interstate and a back uh, road type royal area. Does uh? that do anything for you i mean i'm sure it's not going to change an assessment but it might be like well now that makes sense because of a, a b and c yeah for me it'd be interesting to know how much post-mortem did it take to cut her throats because of the possibility that she was fighting so hard in the car that they may have killed her in the car and that ruined their plan, and they got very upset, and they just started tossing things up. I mean, you have nothing to do, you're driving to a location, and you're rifling through what she has. I mean, it could be as simple as that. It doesn't do a, a, a lot of change. It just, as I said, I don't know all the details, and if they can establish, which is very difficult once it's post-mortem, how long it took for um, this, this last to throw after the actual homicide, it would play a part 
in my decision of what really happened, but I believe that it just came to a reaction and then these two clowns uh, involved themselves in a, in a sexual gratification situation where um, they could not, well, these guys are obviously not necrophiliacs like we've had a guy in the last case we talked about who obviously was involved with a body. So this is a different situation which makes these guys a little bit younger too. When, you know, they haven't formed who they are yet, or maybe they have because, and necrophilia was not one of their, uh, their things, but masturbation was to a body. So it almost objectifies the body. They're able to receive and gain sexual gratification from a victim and not have to have contact with her. So that's also kind of a twist as well, because that means that these guys have been able to, or the one guy has been able to sexualize the fact of killing, which is sometimes in these serial killers very unique. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. They usually sexualize the rape, which is sexual, but it's also a a control thing. It's also a violent act. But if they're able to sexualize killing, that makes them even more dangerous because now you have a guy with an appetite just to kill and he gets his sexual gratification from the kill itself. And that is something that's very similar to Richard Ramirez. Although he burglarized the places, his uh, ability to sexualize control and the kill in both men and women make him very unique. You had talked briefly about maybe a correlation between uh, Bideker and Norris. If I'm not mistaken, didn't they, I mean, I know they had the murder van or, what, or whatever it was, but they, they tortured their victims as, as well, right? They did. They're, they're, they're called the toolbox killers because a uh, hammer, a sledgehammer, and things of that sort to, to not only just kill the victim, they glorified and they reveled in the fact that they were torturing these young women. Uh, they actually recorded the girls screaming, and it's it's horrible. I've actually heard some of the recordings. These guys were uh, demented, twisted, but you were right. They they tortured their victims, and this is part of the gratification that they receive from it because it's part of the control factor. Because now that I'm thinking about it, I think there was some indications in Julie's case of her being tortured, like a cigarette lighter mark or something. There was some sort of torture that I researched, but I can't remember what. Um, that would certainly, you know correlate to uh, the toolbox killers. I'm not saying obviously it wasn't them, but individuals that think like them. Yes, but it would change then my perspective on that I, I basically she fought back and this is what turned them off. If there was a cigarette burn and indicating she was tortured, it kind of throws off my theory of her fighting back so hard that these guys uh, lost their fantasy ruined their plan yeah and it wouldn't it, it, this was excited more if she fought back the more she fought back the more they could control her their sexual heightened it heightened every time she fought back more and by all indications she was strangled her clothes were still on she was tied behind the back she, her throat was slit that seems to indicate that they lost control of her and they ended up killing her almost like by mistake and then that ruined their plans well it makes sense i mean but it certainly could be a combination of of both where you know it starts off as a uh you know a fetish torture sexual gratification and she does fight back and it does ruin their plans, and it ends up happening just the way you say it, right? It could be a combination of both. Yeah, it, it could have been, but it, it would indicate then that, that these killers were 
extremely novice, or this may have been their first victim because it's actually very difficult to manually strangle somebody. It's very difficult. It's very difficult to do it so much that you can't revive the person, the person won't come back. You have 60 seconds remaining. It seems to be that they lost control, they got enraged, and they strangled her, and that's why there's a slip after the throw. It's like, look what you've done, you've ruined it, and the guy gets so enraged that he slits her throat after she's dead. So, yeah, that, you, know, you know, killing someone is a, is a moving element. Sometimes you can't control the aspect of it, and this case obviously has that. Uh, let me call you back. Okay. Thank you for using Global Tail Link. I'm back in. Okay, hey, before we get started here, um, I, or before you get started, I should say, I, I want to tell the audience, this is a prime example of how important it is <clears throat> to have police reports because one little detail can throw off your whole assessment. Um, much like we just did here when I just talked about the possibility of a cigarette lighter being or a torture, some sort that I kind of remember. And immediately Bill's mind starts uh, going into going down another road saying, oh, wait a minute. This triggers this for me. And this is what I know if somebody does that. So that's why it's very important. And I always stress it, police reports are where it's at because that's where the facts are. That's where the details are. So all these amateurs that go off and, and want to say, hey, it's the hoodie guy in the surveillance video because look how far he is from you know the, the victim's car. And they don't know that. None, none of that's relevant. The relevance is inside the police reports. They know the facts. They know the truths. So I just wanted to reiterate, that's why it's so important when available to go off of police reports. But sometimes we don't have that. And we just do the best we can with what we got. So I just wanted to let you guys know that. And you're exactly right about that. For me, all these cases are a very big jigsaw puzzle. And each piece I put in forms a picture for me. At least, I don't have the face of the killer, but I have the type of killer. There are certain types of serial killers. There are certain type of other type of killers. There are rapists. There are different people. So I have this, these files in my head because, you know, as we've said a number of times, there isn't a person that I can think of on earth that has the experience that I have with serial killers. 40 years, I lived with them. I spoke to them every day. At one point, the St. Quentin Warden made me the IDAT worker, and I was pushing these guys around a wheelchair. I talked to them every day, and I asked them these questions specifically about these type of cases to get their assessment. They had no reason to lie to me because I was considered one of them. So, like Ken just said, the burn mark could make a big issue because what it does is it, I have this file in my head and I put a different puzzle in it and it changes things a little bit. Um, that's why law enforcement are the best people to look at these type of situations. The police report is very important. Now also, this is 1995, the collection of evidence. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. The integrity of the evidence collection is extremely, it's everything. Ken will tell you, this is probably the, the crux of the, the investigation. And I'm willing to bet that in 1995, this is a wooded area, this is the side of a road or something. There probably wasn't enough staff on there that knew in this town about DNA evidence, much less how to collect it. Now we know that the Idaho murders, you had a small town, but within hours, you had like five different agencies. That's why I knew. And, and look, we talked about it on this show. Ken and I went into this about the Idaho murder. And once we knew that all these different agencies, FBI, all these forensic people came in, we knew they were going to catch this guy because the DNA evidence. Back in 95 for the Julie Ferguson case, we don't have this. We have a small town police force that goes in there. They probably found the DNA was on her. These guys probably masturbated on her after she was dead. Had they masturbated somewhere else in that vicinity, they never would have found that. 
because he was on the dirt. Nobody would have thought of bringing a black light or whatever kind of forensic tools they may have had to try and find DNA. So I think there's a lot of missing pieces to this particular puzzle. And as Ken said, the police report is where the evidence is, it's where the investigation, evidence really happens, and it's needed. Yeah, and I always, you know, I just... Uh I just want to stand up and shout sometimes when I get actual police reports uh, from these cases because it's monumental to me. It, it, I really, just like you can, I can like get a, a, a picture. I can't tell you who it is, but I can tell you the type of killer it is. And when I get police reports from victims' families, like uh, Darlene Holst's case, which me and Bill are going to look at, uh, but the video that I did on that, I had a lot of the police reports and crime scene photos. And because of that, I was, I was able to do a, a very good assessment of what the killer was like and how it happened based off that. And if I didn't have that, it would have been a total different game. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't say leave it to police because there's a lot of police that suck. They don't know how to do their freaking job. Uh, and there's experts out there like Bill um, that can look at things differently. So I would never say leave it to police, but I would say leave it to the police reports, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense to me and anybody that has any experience in these fields. There are law enforcement, and I don't want to even say that they just suck. I mean, they do. Some are just incompetent, but some of them just don't have the proper training. They haven't been in a big city like Los Angeles or, you know, whatever city, Miami, New York, where this, they have murders happening by the hundreds a month. So you get exposed to more cases, more police reports, and you have very competent detectives and police that go into these cases and they too can analyze and assess the case and give you the type of killer it is which narrows the scope to a particular type of person and they are very successful in catching these guys in other cases they don't so uh, my suggestion is if you are an amateur there's nothing wrong with getting into pay but get the facts get the facts before you start talking about it putting out their websites with people's names and stuff like that and evidence you believe is true because that slows the process there may be people out there that actually know what they're doing and they spend time on these other websites getting all this false information and later on figuring out it's false it changes the entire picture so you know be responsible I mean, I, I guess that's what you're saying, right, Ken? Be responsible for what you do. Let the experts do what they do. And if you want to become an expert, definitely do your homework before you jump into forming websites and giving false information that throws people off. Yeah, I, you know, the, the rant that I just went on, I guess, a little bit, that, that was just more about how, how one little detail at a crime scene can change an assessment. Um, and those details are usually annotated in the police reports. But I want to get back to Julie Ferguson specifically and talk about two people being involved. Because when you are telling the audience, and I know what you mean, but when you're telling the audience maybe that they stood over the bodies and two people masturbated, you're not saying, because they're probably picturing two people standing there with cigarettes in their mouths with their hats on sideways, uh, you know, masturbating over this dead body. And that's not what you're saying. Uh, it, like Bedeker and Norris did, one went first and was left alone in the van with the individual. And then when the body was dragged out to the dump site, the other individual went out and did their thing, whatever it was, with them. Am I correct in that? That's absolutely correct. Yeah, serial killers normally don't stand over a body with cigarettes and not listening to some kind of crazy music doing this. No, that's not what I meant. And I apologize for not being specific. But yes, you're absolutely right. Bitterker is a perfect example. One would go in into the van. By the way, the, the van's name was Murder Mac. That's what they called their their killing machine, the, the Murder Mac. And they one would go in, torture, rape. Uh, mutilate the body, and then the other one would come in and do some of the same thing, and ultimately one of them then would kill the, the victim. And this is something similar to this in this case as well. Yeah, so I mean, just the thought, you know, the visual 
of two people out in the woods standing there together masturbating over a body is not the visual that I want the audience to get. And it's not your fault. Um, I'm just saying that that's you know what what comes to mind when you say that they are masturbating over the body it's they're like almost like taking turns in a way and if they are the same mindset and it is a fantasy torture type killing for both of them yeah that's exactly right and in these are cases to me i always cringe when we talk about things like this like you know a person masturbating or raping a person we, we were not sensationalizing this and i'm not trying to we're trying to give facts about this case because i'd like if i want to come forward look in all these cases and you know this band someone knows something yeah i'm hoping that with us bringing this case back up it's been several years several decades if someone is going to say look it's time it's time that I tell what I know and someone actually comes forward and gives this family a bit of finalization to this case because it's been far too long. Yeah, let me uh, tell you what bothers me about that red Jetta. Um, what bothers me is if they are not related to this killing, why haven't they come forward? With all the publicity that's around this case, why wouldn't they just come and call police and say, hey, listen, hey, you're looking for me. It was me, my friend, and my sister. Uh, we were, we know Julie, we drove by, we, she stuck her head in, said hi, she looked fine. She, those people would be a crucial witness because really they would have been the last people to see Julie alive and maybe they could give crucial information to the case. Yeah, well, there's a number of reasons for that. Maybe let's just and this is me just throwing things a few sticks on the wall. Yep. Maybe they, uh, first of all, they're, they're African-American from a witnesses thing, and maybe they think, shit, if I go up front and I say something, they're going to pin this on me, number one. Number two, they may have been selling weed, and she knew them. Well, what were you doing in that parking lot? They think they can't trust another person or their, their brothers and sisters or whatever. And they, hey, look, if we go forward, they're going to bust us for, uh, for selling weed or selling whatever. We don't know exactly what every teenager does. Julie Ferguson seems like a great kid. It doesn't make her any less of a great kid if she smokes a little pot or whatever. So I, I don't know the reason for it, but as I said before, I don't believe that car's involved. The witness said that she stuck her head in the car. You don't stick your head in people's car, especially young women, when you don't know the people. So I would say that that car is not involved for that reason. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, anything else you want to add on this case before we uh, wrap it up? No, that's about it. I mean, this is, this, this is a tragedy. I mean, such a young, vibrant child. Well, I say child because she was 17 years old. And what happened to her was just terrible. And I really feel for the, for the family, and I hope that this case is resolved. At least we get someone in custody who is responsible for this heinous crime. Yeah, and one thing that I always like to stress is that it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. And what that means is that uh, the police may know. They may have a suspect. They may, you know, have uh, something circumstantial where they know, but they can't prove it. So they're not going to put it out there. And maybe they're waiting for a DNA hit or, or whatever it is. But it, a lot of these cool cases, and I, and I mean over 50% of them, the police know who did it. Uh, it's just they can't prove it, and you only get one shot, so they're not going to, to, you know, blow their wad, so to speak, on, on that one shot when they don't have the one piece of evidence. So I don't know whether that's the case here in Julie Ferguson or not, but again, my uh, heart goes out to the family, as always. Uh, the pain that they go through, I've seen it hundreds of times. You sit in the living room with these family members, and uh, you see the void in their eyes, so I get it. And uh, I just, I hope this does something. Let's call Angela. Tell I hope it, uh, monitored and recorded. I hope it gets the word out. And, then, you know, and that, that's what's important, too, is getting this case, keeping it in the public. Because loyalties change, friendships change, allegiances change over time. So now's the time to come forward. So with that, Bill, I'll leave you, I'll leave you with the final thought and let these audience know where they can find you. Well, I'm, my, my feelings mirror yours. This is a tragedy, and we want uh, 
couple minutes. You have 60 seconds remaining. If you're listening, please come forward. Um, please sign up for my newsletter. You can sign up at artistwilliamaguerra.com. And as usual, I can be found on uh, on uh, uh, Ken's uh, YouTube channel talking about these places to hopefully bring finalization to a family. And that's about it. Thanks so much for having me, uh, Ken. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Okay, Bill. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you next time.